to state right off that uh, I started studying for this uh, invited symposium about two or three months ago and thought the abstract I've written is not right and decided that uh, if you don't mind, there's something much more important to me and I'm going to discuss that today. And that's how we found minds up and through the 1960s and even the present with good technology of geophysics and how that has changed today and we've been in a field now of uh, bureaucratic capitalism where we've got uh, all types of trace element analysis, uh, isotope studies, and fluid inclusions, and it has an amount of millibeams for discovery. So this is, <laughs> this is my approach. I, now what's right do I have to talk about, and I'm going to concentrate only on lead isotope geology after I show you how we did it in the past. The lead isotopes, uh, because um, I don't have that right really as I have a background in mathematics. I worked in mass spectra gas in 1954, and I've walked over hundreds of miles of ultra matrix, which is the key to this talk. So first, how did we do it in the past? If I can have a link. I'm going to take Kid Creek. I'm sorry, uh, but I've got to do something I'm really familiar with. And in the beginning, the concept was that we all massive salt bodies were in volcanic arcs. Within those arcs, there was about 10 to 5 percent rhyolites. 90 percent of all the, uh, the, the massive sulfides of the world were in those rhyolites. And there were 900 deposits in the world that I mapped back or studied back in 1957. Now, there are the arcs. They haven't changed much. They're still the same. And on every one of those arcs are our massive sulfide deposits. Now, knowing that, we then, I was invited to uh, take over the Canadian Shield for Texas Law Crawford. Now, it's hard to see from where you are, but on the right, you should move along. And on the very up uh, northwest corner is Cliff Pond. So we're talking about 1,500 miles or so. The brown are sedimentary basins, on the flanks of which are volcanic arcs. And it's those arcs that I was primarily interested in in Canada. And I decided to work on the, west, or the eastern shield initially. Now, just to show you, this is 500 miles from Shibuk, Shibugamo on the right to uh, Kid Creek and Timmins on the left. With a Cessna 180 on floats with an 11 foot Peterborough canoe, a pilot and I traversed that whole area in six months, separating the rhyolite volcanics from the andesites and sediment, and also outlining the ultimatics, which are very important. I think they're the throat a very massive sulfide, whether it's only a few feet away or down there several hundreds of feet. Now, and of course, when this was made, Kid Creek, uh, or before this, when we first sketched Kid Creek, but we discovered on the left, and uh, Miranda was the key to everything. Oh, excuse me. Uh, so Miranda was the key. After the study in that area, there was an outcrop in this region that was, that, uh, was carried out of the quartz sericite schist, schist. In those days, quartz sericite schist were almost always rhyolites. And anything that was quartz in them was usually a rhyolite. So I concentrated initially on that area. And now this is the detail of uh, the, the airport at Timmins, where we eventually found Cape Creek, the Lexo Mine, and the Canada Scotia. Now these are the key to that particular area being important. One, I knew the volcanic arc was mineralized both with copper, lead, zinc, very weak and very low grade. And uh, of course, people had a lot so. So an area was outlined in this region after that canoe traverse I was telling you about, which is 20 miles long. It turned out that Hugh Clayton was here in the room with me, who was our lead geophysicist at that time. We laid out an area 20 miles, and Hugh said, my God, man, we'll fly that in two days. So we extended the area all the way along here. Now the important thing is the ultimatics you see are only magnetic contours. And the magnetic contours were extremely important to us. So at this stage, mag magnetism from magnetics and uh, EM from an aircraft that was being developed was the key to this whole program. This is the, uh, the helicopter with a rigid boom probably developed by Arthur Grant, we want to use this, but built by Ken Brunnick and the contact glass and very 
and our geophysicist, Bruno Steele. Now, the first flight, we went, I went out uh, as the uh, observer and flew the uh, Tama Scotia line at different altitudes. And you can see here at 150 feet, it turned out to have a very nice in phase component on it and an out of phase. So we thought maybe about 100 feet, 150 to 80 miles an hour would work out pretty well. Now, the wind was going, we were low on fuel, but I decided to go check out that outcrop I told you about on the same day, March 3rd, about noon, 1959. And by mistake, I flew right down with the strike of the ore body. We never had numbers like this, I don't think you can. And this I picked as an east-west structure, and that was wrong. And that was because it had been logged. And this is the outcrop of Sarasite Schist, and we should ride on the of course, air fall. And this is the very important rhyolite trimetal outcrop, which is the key to the whole thing. Later on, Hugh Clayton and George Podolsky picked the anomaly of this aerial photograph from the Cessna as being that orientation. Now, in June and July of 1955, Hugh Clayton, uh, with a proper picking, flew across the deposit like this and got a very nice anomaly. And then, of course, we discovered it on the ground. Now, the deposit, I've got this uh, map oriented to the north on the right. Sorry about that. This is the football. And what you're looking at is a map. But the map really is a cross section because the beds are about vertical. Uh, this is the famous uh, rhyolite fragmental outcrop, which is, of course, a rhyolite dome that was shattered. And this is the airfall tooth, which really uh, is not part of the air or the ore body at all. And the ore is in white. 30 million tons of about two and a half percent copper, six and a half zinc, only about two tenths is lead, and in the beginning about 14 ounces of silver per ton, but it's down to four ounces of silver now. It's been it's being mined of course this time. Now this dome is in the light yellow. It was shattered. The stringer zone of copper pyrite, which is so common these deposits here. The important thing is in the Archean, wherever you go, Australia, Mons Capri. Uh, and even possibly to your own, you have the ultramafic going right up into the throat of the volcano. And it, of course, differentiates from the rhyolites, and that's why the, the rhyolites are important. Although a lot of people in this world don't think rhyolites have anything to do with it. They're dead wrong. <laughs> what would they do? Texas Gulf. And one man in coveralls with steel stuff, which is 
went through the area, uncoupling uh, farmers' wells, logs about 100 holes, and discovered a deposit that's 90 feet deep and 55 feet thick of fairly good grade phosphate. Well, we went on and we put a circular hole down the dredge. Now this dredge is now 90 feet below sea level. And if you look at the, uh, the face there, that is the phosphate bed, just beginning to show that it was 55 feet thick. This is the older version. This test, our previous test with split core, said those walls were cold. So we made the test anyway. You never want to believe anything that's too scientific. And sure enough, the, 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 they held up and we're now dry mining camping for about 35 meters. And it's the largest vertically integrated phosphate mine in the world. Now, this was discovered by the technology, the simulation probe, and of course the geologists. So this conference is tied into uh, technology, science, the geologists, and the water product. And it just works every time. Now what's happened to us in the last 30 years, we haven't developed any new geophysical techniques that are worth a hoot. We're still finding these mines by EM, magnetics, aerial photography, simulation, whatever you want to, good solid stuff. Along comes the academics, which are fine people, and the USGS, which are fine people, not under the constraints of a free enterprise system, and they start going up these awful, awful programs when one is isotope geochemistry. And I'm going to start with just lead isotopes and what our future is in that field. <laughs> now I'm just showing you a picture of the sun only to let you know that things are molten. Now this is a, a nuclear reaction and therefore it has to be hot. Now the spectral lines, this is the very fringe of the sun, that's all we can really see. All I want to point out on this chart here, and that's these point. This is lead, this is thorium, and this is uranium. And all of this is what we're going to be talking about. As quickly as I can be dry, I'm to bore you to death. Now, the origin, now look, this is what we geologists should get involved in. That. The geochemists and the astronomers have gone mad. Now, this is the dust gas cloud that under this system, forget this one for a moment. And because of gravitational interpretations, the cloud finally developed a circular ring. And through a gravitational discontinuity, again, it swings off a planet. Well, that's quite a theory. And let's go to the next one. This one now is, a, is the same gas cloud. Only thing that the sun doesn't ignite in here until about this time and blows all the gas away eventually. It's still not ignited in here. This sun is not ignited. It's got a gas cloud with particles of, of fragments. And you can see the planets forming in here through the accretion. And here they're still doing it. Finally, they, they ignite and blows all the gas away, and here's the planets, and there's the sun. Now, stop and think about this, geologist. Right at this point in here, we are developing accretionary material, which is unrelated to the Earth. It's got a lead isotope ratio tied in either to the Feldspars, if they're there, or into pure type if it's there, or a galena if it's there. And it has a it has a signature, and if you want to believe that signature, I can show you a lot of faults in that moment. That gives you a much younger date for our Earth than what I'm going to propose to you. Because before the Earth ever became molten, these fragments in here were already formed, and they had exactly what we want: lead isotopes. Now, at this stage, the Earth is pretty molten. It's, but it's going to cool down, of course, because space is so cold. The gas is keeping it warm here. It's finally molten. Now, the molten part, according to our uh, isotope geochemists, is so important because it keeps uh, everything in a homogeneous state. The lead and the uranium, say, are dispersed equally, and that's very important. But remember, you, you have now this homogeneous state, but already these asteroids are out there with lead isotope ratios. Now this is the uh, asteroid item that they give you an example. And that's one of 
one of those probable early asteroids that didn't accrete. You know, the accretion takes place at optimum velocity. If it's too high, it bursts the, the, the proposed planet apart. If it's too low, it doesn't stick. If it's just right, it sticks to accretion. That's the theory. And uh, whether you believe it or not, that's what they all believe. The isotope geologist that it works. Now, this is the product that those asteroids were interested in, this iron meteorite, two of them right here. And they have a lead isotope ratio that all current isotope lead geologists believe formed at the same time the Earth formed. Now remember, the Earth had to go through a period of molten ability and then finally a crust. And when it developed a crust, we can call it the planet Earth, and we can take samples from it. When it's molten, you can't do anything. Now, galena is important because galena then freezes the lead isotope ratio in time. There's no uranium in it, so whatever you get out of that galena is what was there when the galena mineral formed, and that's true on the accretion. As long as you're not taking uh, some uh, zircon or something like that out of the uh, out of the asteroid. Now, I don't want to bore you with the equation. I just want to show you it's wrong. This is a basic uh, uh, integral that you can find in any school book. And what Holmes did, he substituted some constants in here. This is the asteroid, uh, that, or the iron meteorite, that has a little preliminary uh, 206 to 207 ratio of about 9 to 10, something that way, 9.3, I'll say. And then this is the, 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 the uh, decay of uranium with its decay constant at the beginning of the Earth at t time t. And we're going to let that t time here uh, go to zero, and that makes it one. And you can see down here, you come up with an equation, something like this. Now, this has to do with the U3, uh, the, the, no, I'm sorry, the 238, 235 ratio. This is, again, that very important ratio of the asteroid, which is just a bunch of bull. And this is the, uh, the what we're looking for. Now, this is the slope of a straight line. And we know this is probably correct uh, from a mathematical point of view. So we can plot this slope. This is a transcendental equation. We can't solve it for t. So we do it by uh, the old-fashioned method of trial and error. And particularly, this is the one we want to use right here. This is the slope. And if we plot values of t for this equation, you get numerous. We can go from zero, and that's typical. We got that hospital rule, and that's a very difficult thing to do. But you can plot it from one, two, three, four, five million years, etc. And that, that's what uh, the isotope gel has done. And this is that slope right here. And this is time, as I say, moving T, which in the beginning is erroneous. And you come up with uh, uh, 0.63, something like that, right in here, which is 4.55 million years from the age of the Earth. Now, they want to relate the asteroid or the iron meteorite now to the Earth. And uh, they make a geocron, whole time constant, and this is the original uh, ratio of the uh, of, of the asteroid or the iron meteorite. And these are stony meteorites where you can get the lead out of the feldspars or whatever. They draw a straight line, call that a geocron, and they say, aha, we have elements of the pelagic sediments that give an average value of the lead isotopes of the Earth right there, and therefore that meteorite is absolutely tied to the Earth. And of course, that's baloney because. As you see, there's a great range, always from about 10 to 20, never more, of uh, these ratios in the Earth, and it's just by coincidence that a line passes through. Now, uh, don't look at this part of the curve at all. This is what I calculated using those equations for different times of the Earth and the curvature of the growth of lead in, but because of the decay of uranium. And it's pretty interesting, of course, as you can see, the 235 is firing off so quickly, it's leading to steam around uh, 3 million years and flattens out a bit. But the point I want to make is, from right in here is a vacuum point on this growth curve where we have no information. Now, Barberton, which I didn't put on here because this is a volcanic heart curve, uh, would be there. The moon would be about right here. I think the, uh, the origin of the Earth was sometime around the time of the moon, right in here, and this is where they got it because of the iron meteorite, which I tried to show you uh, 
occurred well before the Earth ever was born. And that's called the Lake Milk Curve. Now, I, that, now I'm going to leave uh, the origin of the Earth, uh, or, the, or the time of the Earth now, and skip on to uh, rocks. And what we do then, of course, is we use this equation right here for the time. We can solve for time, you know, this is not transcendental, so we can solve for time. And we can get the age of the Earth. And you can see now, look at my age here. I got a 1,400 uh, million years here. I can't quite see it, but it's probably about 12. And then there's one down here with a different one, and I can't quite see that either. But it's, uh, they're all different by two or three hundred million years. And that's because uranium is moving around in the system. This is a zircon crystal with feldspar, I mean with the uh, glad, but of course there's uranium and all the feldspar. So it's really, and it becomes very difficult to solve. And we finally have to go to the Concordia dragon. I don't want anybody to think about it. But there is problems with lead dating in zircons. And if you have a zircon date, don't believe it. Now, I want to now shift gears and now go to how they really use this. Because if you can use a lead isotope ratio of 206 to 204, 207 to 204, you, it's really easy. So what they do, they just measure those isotopes and then they predict what's going to happen. So, but the ones I'm going to talk about are the ones in the metal. This has to be circulating homogeneous lead and uranium. It has to be homogeneous. And that's the, uh, the, bulk, the volcanism starts in the bay off zone, certainly deeper than that, probably 700 kilometers. And uh, you can grow, maybe, now we'll go back to the growth curve. This is the growth curve, and the oldest real volcanic arc deposit, which all of them should come from the mantle in their own time, uh, is Cape Creek, and most of three, most of three, about three billion years old, Cape Creek about 1.7, and they don't plot quite right. And why? And of course, when you look at their plots, on their stuff, like Broken Hill and Mount Isa, which don't belong in this chart at all. They're not volcanic arc deposits. That's what they were trying to do. Uh, the mine don't plot that well. And you can see now, as you get up near the time, uh, they're terrible. Yes, but this is the Dock Lake, which we found, of course, believing in Sweden, et cetera, et cetera. So this right in here is a problem. But I'm very proud that the Aleutian Arc, right here, falls right on the curve. And the Aleutian Arc comes directly from the middle. So what they've done, they take West Shasta. Here is West Shasta with volcanics, and uh, here is uh, the uh, rhyolite. And the problem is, in this particular study of just lead isotopes now, they want to find out where the ore came from. Well, I know it came from the mantle. I don't have to be told that, but they need to be told. And this is the ratios here of 207 to 206. And uh, here is the Woodlong deposit in Australia. And here is their calculation of the bony mantle that makes the wood long deposit coming from the mantle. This is a very, very difficult com uh, com complication. I won't go into it, but it's, uh, it's questionable. Although I know it came from the mantle. Now, uh, moving up, I, I said that was wood long, that was Shasta, West Shasta. Uh, this is the wood long, and what they've done here, they've got uh, the red uh, uh, lead deposits with those isotope ratios. And then in the Stringer zone, they say, aha, the Stringer zone came in diff at a different time because the isotope ratios are different. Well, of course they, they came in at a different time. If the if copper came with lead zinc, it would have dropped in the, in the zone. And now, finally, up in BC, uh, some fellow, I won't mention his name, wrote a paper, he put the lead zinc, lead, uh, 207 and 206 together, divided by lead 204, and made a contour. And these are the important lines right here. When you get beyond this contour, there will be no mines. Well, this is the Tom, and this is the Howard Pass that we found a couple of years later. So, in conclusion, and I say that the time, uh, isotope ratios haven't done a thing for us, and 20% of our papers are on these ratios. And we sit in the, in, like we're sitting right now, we listen to this stuff, we really don't know half the time what they're talking about, and we've got to start questioning all this new information that is geochemical and I think not factual. Thank you. Our final paper is the use of 